Hello and welcome to SLU. I'm Paul Cox, your host for the next hour. And alongside my special expert guests, we're going to learn about tonight's celestial event, the full sturgeon supermoon. Uh, we are going to learn what puts the super in supermoon and why this particular full moon is named after a rather peculiar fish. I hope we got a photo of the fish that this is this full moon is named after because it's, it's like some prehistoric animal but of course this is slu so we are also going to have live telescope views of earth's closest celestial neighbor uh, throughout the hour now then if you are new to slu and you don't know anything about us then we'll tell you a little bit about what we do here especially of course in the run-up to the new school year. Uh, we'll talk more about this later, kind of interspersed with everything else about the supermoon. Uh, but here are some of the highlights. So in preparation for the new school year, we've got new quest learning activities and we've got one of our special guests is the guy who actually writes most of those, our director of curriculum, Dr. John Beauvais. Uh, we've got some amazing new tools for educators and even school districts to make it even easier to bring live astronomy into your classrooms. And oh, something we might talk about, I didn't tell anybody we'd talk about this, but maybe we will a bit later on. Uh, we are launching a new independent study program, which includes something that we're calling Space Explorers Club, which is run by students. Um, and it really helps, you know, space industry, workforce development, and loads more in that program. That's gonna be really, really exciting. We're really excited about that. And of course, last week, we saw the first release of what we're calling Next Gen SLU. And we've got another release uh, before the school year starts we have got oh, i'm really excited about this one we've got a new australian observatory launching with a new half meter telescope coming online we've got a new mega telescope coming online in the canary islands later on this summer uh, and at the end of the star party we're also going to fit here actually not what we've been what we're looking forward to but actually what we've been doing because slu has been bridging the gap uh, for students who couldn't live without a bit of ast astronomy. And we've had our astronomy camp, which has been running over the last six weeks. And we're going to hear a little bit about what they got up to a bit later on. But anyway, what are we going to watch tonight? Well, we are watching, as I say, the full Sturgeon supermoon. We've also sprinkled in a bit of comet dust at the end because we've got, I, I need everybody to remind me of this near the end. We've got a very special glimpse of an amazing comet that students have been monitoring every single night. Uh, but anyway, hopefully you can see my screen. So if you are new to SLU, this is SLU's website. It's called the dashboard and we can see here Canary Islands Observatory is online. We've got Canary 1, Canary 2, Canary 3, Canary 4 telescopes online. And here's the Chile Observatory that is coming online in one minute and 45 seconds time. Most of these telescopes are going to be looking at the moon. Let's take a quick look at the first live feeds. <laughs> and not to disappoint, here we are. This is the Canary 2 Ultra Wide Field Telescope. This is the best telescope to use for the full moon disk views. We've got some close up views as well a little bit later on, but there you go. That is our first sighting of the full Sturgeon Supermoon. And as I said, we're going to be learning. All about that a little bit later but actually you know without further ado i think uh we should invite my first guest on straight away dr john bovair hello john what do you think of that first glimpse of the sturgeon supermoon oh it was gorgeous it looking really great tonight uh the mari is looking beautiful the raid craters which are those craters with the kind of spikes coming out of them they're looking beautiful crater tycho in the bottom left there coming in great it is looking rather spectacular but i've got a sneaking suspicion you're going to tell us a little bit later on right you were pointing out those features but i got a sneaking suspicion you're going to tell us a bit later on that actually the full moon isn't the best time to observe those features it's an absolutely awesome event to actually watch. And don't forget, because it's a full moon, as the sun sets, the moon is rising. So it's really easy to tell when this is going to happen. But but John, what else are we going to be talking about tonight? We're, we're going to, I'm going to be asking you first of all, aren't I, kind of what puts the super in super moon, but what else are we talking about? Uh, yeah, so after we go through that, we're going to 
we're going to learn a bit about um, why why the full moon it maybe isn't the best time to look at craters and other features on the moon. We'll kind of learn why that is. Uh, we're also going to learn why this moon is called the Sturgeon Moon. And uh, we're also going to learn a little bit about how some of the other other cultures from around the world have uh, called this August full moon. So it's going to be pretty exciting. Yeah, we've got another special guest, uh, Milton Villarul. Uh, he's uh, a Quest author on your Quest authoring team. And he's going to tell us a little bit about the lunar law from South America. And it is absolutely fascinating because don't forget, you know, cultures down the ages have used the moon as their calendar. And so many modern calendars are still linked to the lunar cycle, which John's also going to tell us about the lunar cycle, and it's all oh, yes. around the Earth and stuff like that. Um, we're also going to have that update at the end uh, of the star party, telling you a little bit about the new Australia Observatory, some of the new quests, John, that you're launching, the independent study program that I've already teased. But I think we should probably go back to basics right now and tell us. What is a supermoon? What makes it super? So supermoon is captivating because the moon is looks much bigger in the telescopes than what we normally see. Ooh, this is a nice one coming out of, of Chile 1. It is have sure we to got grab it rising, some right? So I don't think we've got wow. it rising, all right? But this is a close-up. So this is a bit a bit smudgy this particular live telescope feed because it's the first mission of the night that's when somebody's controlled the telescope to point it to a particular object and the moon is very very low on the horizon uh, from the Chile observatory in fact it's just it's only just popped up above the Andes mountain range but uh, we can see here as our ultra wide field view John have we got I wonder the half meter telescope view <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. that is spectacular Ooh. we some we don't normally use the mm. half meter mm. telescope to view such a bright object as a moon and we have to do some really clever stuff to be able to capture such a bright object um with such a huge telescope a lot of the students that use SLU can actually fit inside that half meter telescope it is so big and that's actually what i do to clean it john i don't know if you've ever seen a photo of that i kind of climb in through the through the truss tube and and, and clean it but this is uh, absolutely spectacular and this tells us a little bit actually about the size of the moon that we'll talk about later because if if students can actually compare this super moon that looks a bit larger this month uh, to what we sometimes call a micro or a mini moon when it's a lot smaller. And if they capture two images with the same SLU telescope, they can compare them. I'm hoping at some point you're going to come up with a quest learning activity. But anyway, now that we have looked at that absolutely spectacular image, and don't forget, uh, if you're watching, if you are a SLU member, a student watching, all you've got to do on any of the live telescope views, you get to use all of these telescopes, by the way, just click that little camera icon. And I have just saved my very own personal image of the full sturgeon supermoon john this is one of the best images i've captured of the moon for a long time look we can still see yeah. a little bit of shading you know just on the outer edge of the limb but i don't know if you can see through here on the screen share but i can actually see the mountains and valleys on the edge it's not a smooth circle is it and you know, there's That's some right. great stuff actually that we can see during the solo clips but john i'm sorry I keep, I, i'm getting way too excited all right so back to telling us what makes a super moon super i mean other than these live images i mean this this, this is truly an amazing image right here i really uh, snap it if you didn't paul's not kidding this is a beautiful one um so the 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 supermoon is called super because where it's at in its orbit, it's a, it's a bit closer to us than it normally is. And that means that it's going to look bigger to us when we see it in the telescopes. Now, what's, what's pretty interesting is normally the moon is about a half of a degree size in the sky. And if we, this is a beautiful image of Canary One, I hope it's not going to move in a second, but we can see on the, on the right side of the image, there are these numbers and a little scale that is measuring the the number of arc minutes the the moon is 
Now, the moon's typically about 30 arc minutes in size. And if we look, we can see that the moon is definitely bigger than 30 arc minutes yeah. here. So this is the super of the uh, of the super moon. It, and it is really easy to see when you have you know, more than one image to compare it by. You know, but uh, you know, a lot of people say, oh, you can't tell the difference. But my goodness, you can, especially if you capture two images between micro and full moon. So, yeah, I can even show you one of those. Uh, oh, yes, John. Yes. If, if you need me to like. stop sharing. Yes. I, awesome. So usually when when we think of the the moon orbiting around the sun, we normally think of something like this. And if you look at this animation, it doesn't really look like the distance between the Earth and the moon changes very yeah, much. Yeah, it looks but... pretty circular to me. So, ah. Yeah. Mm. So here, let me, let, me, let me stop the animation. And so here we can see that there are certain parts in the moon's orbit when it's closer to us, and there's other parts when the moon's very far away. Scientists have these special words for them called perigee and apogee. So what's happening right now there's a full moon when the moon is near this perigee location. And uh, as, as Paul was mentioning, here is the comparison oh, between excellent. the two. Excellent. So these are the these are the astronomical terms. So we're using the term supermoon, which is what a lot of people use, which I actually love because it gets people excited about what it is. And we've taken the moon for granted. You know, we rarely look up at it. You know, sometimes in the city, you can it's even difficult to tell. People don't really know where to look for it. But we call it a supermoon. So I love that because it gets people interested. But here you're using these different terms. You've got apogee micromoon and a perigee supermoon. Yes, these are uh, incorporating the more scientific terms, the perigee and apogee, meaning the location of where the moon is in its orbit. It's actually kind of uh, interesting to think about, but the moon passes through apogee and perigee every month. Um, mm -hmm. It's just they don't always line up with the full moon. So when they do line up with the full moon, then we can see the moon in it, the moon's disk in its full glory. And uh, like we have tonight. Um, and I think, John, you can it's also possible to have. Yeah, that's great. If you can also be sharing the, the live view as well, you can also get. Um, so this is a full supermoon, but you can also get um, a a new supermoon as well, when the very first crescent is a lot, lot larger than normal. But of course, this month, if you go back to your diagram again, what we've got, if we've got a full supermoon in a month at perigee, when the moon's on the opposite side, it's so it's going to be a new moon, it's going to be further away so actually that new moon is a lot smaller on the same month that we get a super moon so john i'm really looking forward yeah. to a quest that kind of shows this so um i'm gonna i was gonna ask you about it later but we've mentioned the word w what is a quest because it's it's the your primary job and role at slew director of curriculum what on earth is a quest because i love them. quests are our learning activities that we have on SLU. They're coherent, well-sequenced, experiential learning activities that use SLU's telescopes to capture images of celestial wonders while learning about specific aspects of astronomy, such as history, science, anthropology, arts, and a myriad of other esteemed topics. These quests are designed to keep students engaged, excited to learn, and they end up culminating in creating poster-sized infographics that showcase the images that students capture themselves. So Excellent. we're going to so, be... So if students are watching tonight, and I know we've got quite a few looking in on the Star Party page at the moment, if they come up to the live view, snap their image, I would certainly recommend from uh, either the Canary One Half Meter Telescope or the Ultra Wide field telescope snap their image of a full moon they can fill that right hand box in there on their quest poster yeah that's right that's right Ooh. that's going to uh, be a special one because not only is it the full moon it's full sturgeon super moon so uh you've got something launching haven't you later on this summer for quests where a student would actually be able to basically make that poster themselves rather than just fill in the blanks and they could actually write in there full sturgeon supermoon and stuff like that and they can really customize them and personalize them can't they 
Yes, that's right. You can even, yeah, put in full, uh, full sturgeon supermoon under here. You could put in the dates. Um, you could change the, the fonts, the colors. Um, other things that I think are going to be really exciting is students will be able to uh, crop and zoom and um, uh, change the contrast values of their images. So maybe okay. the contrast values isn't so important for a lunar phase quest, but for a, like a mystery of the changing moon quest where you're looking at faint features and spiral galaxies, those uh, new tools are really going to help students see those features. Yeah. Now, and that's that's an interesting poster, actually, because um, I want to bring you back to something we said right at the beginning. And if we go to the live view, um, or maybe the Canary One view, if we've got that, um because it is spectacular that's my favorite view of the night it really is um we were saying that the full moon actually isn't a very good time to be spotting lunar features and we do have a quest don't we where uh, students are examining the moon and capturing all of the different features types of features on the moon why isn't tonight a great time to see lunar features because I can see a whole stack. I can see giant craters. I can see huge mare, the seas. I can see huge mountain ranges and stuff like that. So why are you telling us this is not a great time to look at these features? It, it, it has to deal with the configuration of the sun and the earth and the moon right now for the full moon. You see, and when the moon is in full moon, you could think of if you were standing on the moon, the sun is directly above you, shining right down on the moon. And so when this happens on Earth, there's no shadows that are cast. And so shadows are important because they add contrast to your image and that allows you to see some of the features. Now, what's really cool is you actually pointed this out, Paul, already. If we look around the edge of the moon, mm. we can start to see that there's actually shadows there. And this is just a ramification of the moon being spherical. Um, so it, I can show you an example uh, here Ooh, yeah. uh, using a golf ball. Um, a golf ball is a spherical object that has dimples oh, okay. on it that are kind of like craters. And you can see that in the top here, the sun is hitting the golf ball from the right side and the sun's hitting the moon from the right side. And you can see the shadows that are being cast and it almost, almost the image from, from Slew's telescopes looks 3D to us almost with all of that detail. But that same frame, if the sun shines directly down on the surface, we lose those shadows. Just like we lost the shadows on the golf ball when the uh, flashlight a, came that's in. That's a time. great illustration, John. I like that. I hope that's included in the quest, actually, that golf mm -hmm. ball. I think that's this, a really, really good way of showing that. Th this is a sneak peek from one of our new elementary school quests that's going to be launching on August 15th called Moon Shadow. Really and excited I, for this one. And I promise you, I did not know that. I did not know that fact until I asked John. So, OK, so um, and there are um, a whole actually before we move off quest, John, because uh, we're, we're, we're going to do a little bit of a roundup and see what else we're going to discuss during the star party. But before I leave you with quest. What if you're into, you know, we know the new space industries are absolutely massive. We ha are hearing from a whole bunch of students, parents and teachers that how do my kids get into this new emerging multi-billion dollar industry around the globe? What if they're interested in space technology and stuff like that? Have you got any quests that might um, might start getting the juices flowing? Uh, well, for space technology, this I think of, you know, going back to the moon, we have a quest that's all about uh, uh, the Apollo missions and how the Apollo missions got to the moon. They go through all six of the Apollo landings and actually um, uh, students learn a bit about uh, Project Artemis in there, which is going to be taking astronauts back to the moon. Um, November 2024 is uh, when Artemis 2 is planning to launch. Uh, so that's going to be really, really exciting. Gosh, John, I've just had this um, this crazy thought, and, and you don't need to, to say how old you are, but I got a sneaking suspicion you weren't alive when humans were on the moon. That's that's right. That's Is true. That right? Yeah. I can remember yeah. being called downstairs in the middle of the night 
uh, to watch this really fuzzy picture, the one that starts upside down before they had to switch it around the other way. And you could hardly make it out. And there's this kind of tiny kid, I won't say how old I was, but kind of rubbing my eyes and kind of looking. But I can remember just how much that inspired my interest in science and technology. And we have had generation after generation since then kind of bereft of that sense of exploration of our nearest neighbor. You know, yeah, we've had all of these lovely robotic missions here, there and everywhere, but there's something about a human setting foot on our nearest celestial neighbor. So uh, hopefully they will take your Absolutely. Apollo quest and uh, get get more inspired. Definitely. And, I, and, you know, most of the Apollo missions landed maybe kind of around the equator ish of the mm. moon but artemis is going to be landing probably about down here where my mouse pointer is so they're going to be looking at more of the south pole of the moon which is really exciting because not only they're not going to the to the same trails that apollo went through they're, they're blazing their own neutrals in a different part of the moon and as we can see here john the moon is in full sunlight so from our perspective that's what we're seeing but just like the Earth, the moon's poles are, don't get as much direct sunlight. They get a little bit, but not a much. But we've already detected water ice, haven't we, at the moon's poles? So if we've got humans there, then potentially it's a source of obviously water, but also fuel in the future and also a stepping stone to go to Mars and even further afield. So, yeah, I, I, I was born at the wrong time. I want I want a job in the new space industries, but until then, I'm just going to be installing yes. mega telescopes for SLU and loads of students use. Anyway, that's our first little segment. So we've learned about what makes a supermoon super. We're going to talk a little bit later about if it's really super, can there be two supermoons in one month? Because if there's if it's super because it's rare and twice in a month all right so we'll talk about that a bit later but in a little bit uh, in a few minutes time we're going to start talking to john about what puts the sturgeon in the sturgeon super moon and we've also got a uh, slew expert member and quest author milton's going to be joining us uh, to tell us about the lunar law from south america and i think this is going to be um i think milton's going to be talking quite colorfully Right, and don't forget, there's a. I won't. I won't give it away. But the the next supermoon at the end of this month has got a color in its name, not a prehistoric fish. Um, uh, but we're also going to have uh, a Q and A session at the end of the Star Party, uh, and we'll also take a little glimpse at that stunning green comet that uh, SLU members and students are watching and tracking every single night and another comet as well actually we're not going to look at that during the star party but there's another comet that's visible at the moment which has put this huge really unexpected starburst on and looks a really weird shape like some star wars um fighter or something like that but uh, and we're also going to have a little bit of a look back at what uh, students have been doing with SLU over the summer holidays in SLU astronomy camps. That's going to be quite good fun. Anyway, so get your questions ready for the end of the show. But John, come on, let's get straight into this. <sighs> Frankly, what is a sturgeon, first of all? <laughs> it's, it's a very good question. I've, I've, I've known about the sturgeon moon longer than I've known what a sturgeon is. So <laughs> a sturgeon is actually the name of a fish that's native to both Eurasia and North America. Um, and I, I think one of the most interesting, uh, here's a here's a picture of it. It looks it looks uh, it looks rather uh, prehistoric, like you said earlier, Paul. Um, and and uh, it, I think the most fascinating thing that I've learned about this, these sturgeon fishes is that these are the primary source of the world's caviar. Yeah. Um, so they call this moon the, the full sturgeon moon. Um, it actually derives from the Native American Algonquin tribes uh, that are located in northeastern United States, kind of around the Great Lakes region. And during August, uh, this, the lake sturgeon uh, becomes very active, and it's it's becomes like the, the perfect time to go and start 
fishing for these uh, these sturgeon fish. And so okay. um, it's a valuable source of food for for um, for the tribes back then in those regions. And so um, that name kind of got adopted into uh, into like the colonial lexicon for names of the August full moon. So we said at the we said at the top of the star party that you know the lunar phases um, cultures um, down the ages have monitored that and used it basically to form their calendar. It's why you know most calendars are around 28, 29 days. Um, so this particular moon was at their their flag really to say, hey, listen, the next full moon or the full moon after X, Y, or Z is when we should start fishing for sturgeon. But we know that there's a whole stack of other names as well. Were they using all of these other names as well? I've, I think I've heard of a strawberry moon. Isn't there a pink flower moon? Were they using or naming these moons to drive their activity? Yes, yes, they were. Um, here's an example of uh, you always of the have names a of the handy diagram ready, John, <laughs> don't you? You've always got one up your sleeve. Okay, so these oh, are the names you. of the formers, and and different tribes actually used different names, didn't they? Because some of them didn't live near lakes or rivers, so you know, may have been woodlands. So I think you've got the Hunter Moon and stuff like that. Yeah, yes, definitely. These um these names that. That you normally see for the full moon, they come from the uh, the old farmer's almanac, which most of those names for the full moons um, are derived from the Algonquin um, tribes. Right. But uh, so yeah, so like you said, I mean, you, they use these names of the full moons to tell them it's time to start doing things. In July was the buck moon, so that was the time to start doing the hunting. Um, well start seeing the bucks then we have we actually have the hunter moon in october but then there's the corn moon for harvesting, harvesting yeah. and um the strawberry moon for when strawberry started uh the strawberry season started coming around so, then, so did our other cultures have different names kind of not just in you know the americas but elsewhere as well because we'll hear from milton later on actually it'd be interesting to hear from him what traditions there are in south america um, yeah right here, here you've got Okay. Yeah, I, I kind of uh, I got my my image out of my sleeve a little early, um, but uh, but yes, I and I avoided uh, I avoided um, the Inca and South America so that um, you know, Milton would would Not take care of this. Still Milton's thunder. Okay. Um, but but these are some other so even on here there's a, a few other Native American tribes and and you can see that their names were different. Um, mm -hmm. So the uh, the Ojibwe called it the blueberry moon instead of the sturgeon moon and it's probably because there wasn't many lakes nearby like you mentioned earlier right. paul so and and they know that this is this is perfect because this is a perfect name for the august moon because the blueberries are being sold in the store right now and they are so good right now yeah. <laughs> um i think another one that's kind of fun is the moon when cherries turn black so Ooh, it, it corresponds with the ripening of black cherries oh that's um, excellent so it, 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 does any of these kind of pop out to you, Paul? They look kind of interesting. Well, I, I kind of like that one just because it's so descriptive. You know, the moon when cherries turn black, you know, and, and I know that I have the eternal struggle in my own garden and our own cherry trees of getting them just right. And normally it's I get it 12 hours too late and the birds have had the whole lot. Oh. You know, so maybe I need a, a bit of a lunar warning on my own calendar for the, the cherry ripening. But uh, yeah, but I, I, I hadn't actually realized, John, that is the first time that I've seen um, these different names from so many different regions of the world. I mean, we've got, you know, Maoris, you know, in New Zealand, we've got Asia represented there, Hawaii. You know, even Europe there as well. And I think there are uh, some other European ones as well, um, which were very specific um, to the, their particular regions. But yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's really, really fascinating. And, and there's there's some overlap, too. I mean, the Chinese have called us the harvest moon. And, and uh, uh, typically the first full moon after the um, 
the 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 fall equinox is uh is the full the harvest moon in north america but it's interesting that they even though they're not the same language they still end up calling the moon the same thing sometimes like harvest moon well john you just mentioned uh, you just mentioned or said some terminology hop back to um hop back to the half yes. telescope view if you could oh. um while we talk about this because you did just mention a little bit of terminology astronomical terminology there you said the fall equinox so students might be watching this and they might be looking through all of this and saying well okay here it is it's spread out over the year uh they're using this full moon is for this this full moon is for that well they would have seen nature around so that maybe prompted them what this particular moon probably was but they also needed a way of telling which moon it was in the entire yearly cycle so they were using the sun there weren't they and you mentioned fall equinox what's that about so uh the um the sun it changes its location in the sky throughout the year in the summertime the sun can reach a, a higher altitude in the sky altitude is the angle between the horizon and and whatever object you're talking about and this is why it gets so hot in the summertime and the opposite happens in the winter time when the the sun moves in the opposite direction and it's it doesn't the altitude is very low in the sky an equinox is when the sun is on a line called the celestial equator which is basically the midway point between the north where the north pole is pointing and where the south pole is pointing um and during during the the equinox day uh at the moment of equinox like i said the moon is right on the uh the celestial equator uh, we and, and it's th these solar events we've got equinoxes we've got the solstices these just like actually you know these different cultures monitoring and tracking the lunar phases it's very easy to track the position of the sun unless you're in the uk because mm -hmm. we don't see very much of it it's usually behind the clouds but it's it's tracked in exactly the same way i'm just down the road from stonehenge that entire um neolithic monument is designed to measure where the sun is on the horizon at rise and sunset throughout the year so they can pinpoint with the sun what time of year it is and from that they can be saying okay so the third full moon after the fall equinox is X, Y, Z. So they can pin these full moons down. And if they lost their place, in other words, they could find it back by looking at the sun as well, couldn't they? Yes, they could. It, it's it's amazing the thought that had to be put into all of these things. And now in today's society, it's just right on our phones and we don't even have to, to put a thought, a second right. thought into it. But then mm -hmm. it's amazing that they were able to do that. And I think what's even more fascinating is figuring this this these ideas out and building structures like Stonehenge happened all over the world it's not like it just mm. happened there so um we've got to hand it to us uh humans for figuring this stuff out I think um, exactly exactly so John uh you're going to join us uh, again um a little bit later and especially for the Q&A um We'll, we'll make sure that he's got lots of really difficult questions in there from students who are watching. Um, so Sounds thank good. you very much for your description of what makes a super moon super. Actually, the, you have to remind us when you come back, tell us about what's going to happen at the end of this month. All right. As well, because we've got another special event, moon related event at the end of the month. So please um, butt in and remind us about that one. Uh, but Sounds good. That's great. Thank you, John. Um, before then, don't forget, we've also got a special look at the wonderful comet at the end. John, it would be great, actually, if you could carry on sharing um, the live views um, until Milton wants to share anything. That would be absolutely great. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, and there's no better time um, than to welcome our next guest. Uh, he is a SLU expert member, educator, and Quest author, Milton Villaro. I never pronounce your surname correctly. I deeply ashamed. Don't worry you're, about it, Paul. <laughs> you're, I think your students call you Mr. V, don't they? Exactly. Um, That's my you, brand. You, your brand. Now, you have studied um, archaeostronomy and stuff like that. But in particular, um, 
you 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 love studying and learning about and sharing with your students about South American culture and how they viewed celestial objects like the sun and the moon. What did they think about you know, the moon? The moon. Uh, well, it's a fascinating topic because um, uh, the Inca, for example, in South America, uh, believed in uh, the duality of the universe, the, the masculine and the feminine, for example. And uh, the moon represented exactly that. Um, they associated uh, their calendar to, to the moon cycle. And not only that, but they uh, called the uh, Mama Quilla, the name they uh, had for the moon, as uh, the goddess that would protect uh, uh, women in that case. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, for example, the moment we're living with a super moon is when they thought that this goddess was, uh, you know, very present, uh, even on Earth, let's say, uh, protecting women in general. Was uh, this for any... Well, sorry, was this for any full moon, or were they aware that the moon changed size? Oh, they were aware of that, uh, pretty much aware, because, you know, many of the temples they built uh, were exactly aligned with the uh, moments in which the moon was, uh, as we call it, a super moon. Okay. That's absolutely astonishing, because I think that's the first time I've heard that an ancient culture was aware of this phenomena that we're watching tonight and as we know it's it's fairly difficult if you just look up at a full moon it's quite difficult to tell is this a super moon is it a mini moon unless you're told that it is um and that's what tends to happen on a night like tonight you know the news says you know it's a super moon tonight people go out once again we take it for granted so a lot of people might not have actually just looked up at us at any full moon and thought wow and really taken notice of it so they kind of think wow it is but i do think you know you can tell a difference and certainly a trained observer and certainly if you have any object that you could align that object up with you could easily spot even a couple of sticks frankly you could probably stick up in your garden on a mini moon and align the same thing or a little device you're holding two sticks up to see how big it is you could easily measure this difference in the size so that's amazing that they yeah. were doing that and were able one to of those it. Uh, for example is my father-in-law he's a, a, a an observer of the moon and without telescopes he really can tell you for example where in the sky the moon will be today tomorrow yesterday etc mm -hmm. and uh, not only that but the sizes also he he says you know around these days the moon will be bigger he says uh, and those are things that you develop only when you have when you develop this uh, conscious connection with the universe around you. Yeah, and uh, yeah, he has. And, and uh, you see it month after month after month, after so you month. can see those changes and understand those changes happening. So, tell us a little bit more. Then uh, you were going to talk to us about um, colors. Now, this is the first time I've I think I've heard you talk about this colors and the moon. What's, oh, yeah. what's this about? Well, uh, everybody knows that, for example, during uh, an eclipse of the moon, let's say the moon turns uh, reddish in color. Yep. And that was an interesting, uh, that is uh, also an interesting uh, moment in, uh, in the observation of the moon, uh, because the Inca, for example, thought that uh, there was this big cat, a jaguar, jumping and pouncing on the moon and actually hurting it, right? So the, the blood of their goddess, moon, was uh, shed in this attack. So that's their explanation for the moon turning red during those events. Okay, okay. And we, even now, actually, in fact, some, some very serious astronomers don't particularly like um, a lunar eclipse, a, a, a total lunar eclipse, being called a blood moon but we often call it that and and quite frankly it's it's very rarely very red it's it's normally more of a pink or a peachy color something like that but actually it's a very good indication of the uh, state of earth's atmosphere and viewers and students if you're looking at sunsets and sunrises at the moment and sometimes even a moon um rising or setting you may see that actually they look a lot redder 
than normal. But once again, maybe you haven't noticed because you don't see it. You don't watch it enough. You don't watch it month after month. But the reason why that is, we've got so many fires burning around the globe at the moment. That smoke in the air helps to diffract all of that light, all of that sunlight. And we land up getting far, far redder sunrises and sunsets. But uh, so, Milton, what else did they what else? Well, they... I can tell you, um, because I, right now I'm, I am physically in the land of the Inca. That oh, the moon... are you? oh, this is the first yes. time you've actually spoken to us direct from <laughs> South America. Great. From South America, yes. And the moon today here looked a little pinkish in color, right? Okay. But okay. Uh, for them, uh, this would uh, basically uh, uh, forecast uh, some rain coming tomorrow. Okay, so when the moon turns pink, uh, they will associate that with a very uh, close rain, you know. And okay. apparently the weather has been building up towards that right now. Where we are having a, a very warm winter, uh, hot winter, I should say. And uh, now we have uh, the conditions for a little rain tomorrow, especially early in the morning. Okay. okay. That would so be I'm, one uh, predictor of rain. And, and I think uh, we've got a whole stack of sayings like that, you know, um, which I can never remember in the UK about red sky at night, shepherd's delight and things like that. Um, you know, it's, they've often, once again, been considered. Now, how much science is behind some of that i don't know but john i wonder um if you could uh show us the all sky camera from the canary islands because we've got a very good uh dis you know um illustration of this atmospheric thing so if you just click on that for us um you can just do the static image if you like john okay. have a look at this the static so this is a special camera that we have in the canary Islands. so um this is running during the day at the moment and it runs at night so that's actually the sun going across the sky at the moment um john will let it go on so that's around midday ish uh we did have some solar views because we've got a special um solar telescope at slu in the canary eyes so you get these live views and we've seen so much solar activity but here we go so this is a really good illustration this is great actually john that you've shown the timelines there's the sun setting in the west and then what we're going to see on the left hand side the dome's just over bang there's wow. the moonrise the full sturgeon super moon moonrise but look how it almost looks cloudy or misty there so just hop over to the enders if and just pause it if you could john uh, because here we can see some of the images tonight for some of the deep sky objects and even the moon a little bit fuzzier than they normally are and that's because on the neighboring island of la palma these in the canary islands about 300 miles off the west coast of africa there's, an, there's some very large um forest fires there so we do have a huge amount of smoke in the air and that's what's giving us this kind of slightly foggy view at the moment so but there it is there's the moon so we saw that absolutely classic full moon and this is all full moons it's not just a super moon a full moon rises when the sun sets so they're always really easy to find because wherever the sun's setting just look in the opposite direction which is the eastern horizon and you will see a moon rise we'll maybe talk about uh the lunar uh horizon effect a little bit later there's the telescopes look look uh, moving you could just see the big half meter telescope anyway back to you milton what else can yes. you tell us about another the interesting changes? color in the andes mountains for the moon is the yellowish moon and that okay. usually told them uh, there was a high level of humidity in the atmosphere which meant during the night would be super extra cold for okay. them it was the moment to make something that is particularly uh, you know andean uh, you know they they take the potato and they freeze the potato and when it is frozen and the potato has practically dehydrated they will uh, have uh, created another um, uh, food item let's say that they call chuño which is dehydrated potato only the, the magic of that is that it lasts for a long long time they can store it for, for ages. Exactly, they can store it and they could travel long distances carrying that dehydrated potato. So that they you could have make. invented freeze dried food. Exactly. 
They have that. <laughs> there's nothing new, is there? There's there's nothing new. Whenever we think we've got the technology, we've got the know-how. No, there are little glimpses of it in our past as well. <laughs> and it's why I love events like this, celestial events like this, because here we are, students and experts gathering around the world to witness this glorious event. And frankly, I don't know about you, but these these images tonight that we're seeing from the Canary Half Meter Telescope are absolutely astonishing. We're sharing this around the world. And just like Milton, your ancestors in South America, gazing up, probably telling their countless stories of the moon and Mama Killa. Oh, that's right. Uh, one of the last colors I have for you is uh, silver, precisely, not just because of the color the moon seems to have, but also because the Inca really believed that the moon was made of silver. Uh, they believed that uh, the moon was like a kiln where drop by drop, let's say you would accumulate all this silver from the universe. Mm -hmm. And then when uh, we had the waning uh, moments of the moon, the, uh, they would believe that the moon was actually dropping that silver into the mountains uh, in the Andes. Okay. If you allow me uh, uh, screen share, I will show you one of those. Yes, please. Thank you. I love I love these I love these stories I always do. So. This is an invitation for everybody to look at the uh, the yes. one that I authored next to John uh, about Mama Kilia the Inca Moon, and you can see you know how in the in this uh, diagram we try to portray that precisely the kiln of silver filling up in the waxing region, and today we are uh, with a full moon ready to drop uh, its contents into or onto the, the, the mountains, the mountains in, uh, in the Andes. This one is particularly interesting because it's uh, the one that is called the Rich Mountain. It's in Potosi, Bolivia, where most of the silver that, uh, you know, was taken from South America uh, came from. And interestingly, this silver was at the floor level. Uh, the, the person that discovered silver in this mountain was uh, very cold and uh, he made the bonfire just to keep uh, warm. And uh, the next morning he saw this little trickling of, uh, of uh, you know, frozen wow. silver again. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, you just had to dig with your hands and silver would pop up in, the, in that. I mean, in that, that, that must have been magical in its own right. It know, was incredible. But I, it I, was I, incredible. I, I love the way stories like this are a, a culture trying to explain these natural phenomena and making these connections between there's this silver orb in the sky and it changes and here's this silver that we find in the mountains and connecting these two things up. It's our, it's this quest, it's our ever never ending quest to understand what what our earth does what the universe does and our place in it we just want to find understanding don't we in what we yes see. definitely that well and, and let me it. tell uh, uh, our audience that this was one of the last uh, quests i made not just because uh, i wanted it to be perfect but uh, because of something you said that if you take your pictures uh, over a long span of time, uh, the, the relative size of the moon will change with the, this. And so uh, on one of those pictures, the moon looked uh, too big, too small, etc. I had to pick up exactly one complete cycle, uh, praying for good weather. So yep. <laughs> this one was incredible. Uh, I could do the whole cycle. And now uh, you can see the moon uh, on a very very similar size in all the pictures uh, it takes some patience astronomy is the science of patience but uh, it pays off once you have your collection exactly milton thank you so much um as always it's an absolute pleasure um hearing from you and thank you very much for sharing all of that especially uh, that you're actually speaking from the very place um where most of these stories came from so thank you very much for sharing that and, it's a pleasure uh, may, do hang around please because there may be some questions for you later um in absolutely our &A session. I'll be around. So, right uh what have we got coming up well we've got a little bit of a round table q a uh thank you john we've gone back to oh there it is 
<laughs> smashing view. Uh, actually, I think it was Canary One um, that we've got the comet coming up. So that's going to be in five minutes time. So let's not forget, take a look at that. Now I warn you now, the images of the comet are not going to be as good as you students have been capturing so far this month. But that's because it's full moon and a full moon lights up the sky. It's like nature's light pollution. And what that means is the images that we see um, of fainter objects like comets, galaxies and nebulae can often be affected by that bright moonlight and get a bit noisy. So it's not going to be the best, but they're still going to be pretty good. Um, we are also a little bit later on going to have SLU's event manager. Uh, Gretchen, she's going to be telling us about uh, some news about upcoming member style parties that are going on, webinars for educators, uh, some training webinars, as well as some of this big, big celestial events uh, we are going to be covering uh, both this year or culminating in next year's uh, solar eclipse. But anyway, uh, right now, I want to welcome um, another guest. Uh, it's Keith. Keith has been running um, the SLU astronomy camp. So we've been looking ahead or we are going to be looking ahead, but let's just look back at what we've been doing over the last six weeks. Keith, are you there? I am here. Thank you, Paul, for having me. Yes, astronomy camp. Wow. Five weeks, uh, four days a week. We had a blast. So you had, didn't you, a, a single week that was totally themed ar about the moon? Yes, there was. You know, when I think of the most popular slew objects, I think the moon is definitely one of them. Uh, not only do we see it on slew, but of course, it doesn't cost anything to go outside and, and look at it from your own home. It doesn't really matter where you live. It is the brightest object in the evening sky. And uh, because of Dr. John's great Apollo quests and because of the way I timed uh, Moon Week, which actually coincided exactly with the Apollo 11 mission, Exactly. We had a lot to talk about with the moon. So we, we watched uh, some of the missions live, the Apollo mission live on a great website. And we looked at uh, what we see with the moon, everything from lunar phases. That was the day lunar features. Uh, the moon does all kinds of great things. It passes in front of stars. It passes in front of planets. So we talked about occultations uh, because it follows this path in the sky that we call the ecliptic. We talked about lunar visitations. It will every month every lunar month visit certain uh, certain parts of the sky so it gives great opportunities on slu where uh if the moon is close enough to a planet like mars or uranus uh, we can get it to fit in the same field of view so we get a lot of great uh images that way uh, we talked about the lunar movement and we talked about librations so we've got uh, this super moon here with us tonight, when the moon is closer to us, it also moves a little bit faster. And this is one of those times that we get to see the hidden parts of the moon, and we've got it right here on Canary One. If you look uh, where this little, uh, okay. Yeah, so if you look in the two o'clock position, we've got a couple of things going on where that little uh, right angle is, right on the limb. We have Mare Humboldtianum. That is a hidden sea that we do not see when we don't have favorable libration like we do now. Uh, that, yep, that's it. So the crater there is Endymion, but to the right, that is Mare Humboldtianum. Yeah, when we go down and scroll down to the three o'clock position, that's Mare Crucium. So three o'clock. Mare Crucium is my indicator for favorable libration on the eastern side of the, mm -hmm. of the limb of the moon. We have a dark patch there. We're kind of losing it because the moon is already, it looks yeah. to me that it's past full. That's Mare Marginis, which is one of those seas, uh, again, right on the limb of the moon that we only get to see when we have this condition of favorable libration. So, so Keith, this libration, you know, because we often... Yeah. We often explain to students that we only ever see the near side of the moon. Um, we don't see the far side because the moon is tidally locked. So the same face is always facing Earth, no matter what phase it's in. But there's a little bit of a rock and a roll, isn't it? And that's this libration that you're talking about. So we see more than 50 percent. We get to see sometimes kind of round the corner is how I always picture it. Yeah, we do. Uh, the estimate is about 59%. So when it's okay. 
closer to us and is speeding up a little bit, we'll see that uh, portion here that we're seeing today. And as it moves a little further away and slows down, we have a chance to see the other part of the moon, which is that Grimaldi area. So what we talked about in Space Camp were things like this. If, if Mari Chrysium is away from the edge, we know we're going to be able to see some of those features. And if Grimaldi on the other side of the moon is a little bit moved away again from the edge, we could see the very famous Mari Orientale. Okay. And uh, you can also see it. Yeah, you can see above and beneath, uh, beneath the moon too. It's a little more difficult to see some of the craters. But so I, I saw this in I was hoping we were going to see this tonight. So that's for anybody Thank you for who's interested, that out. they can go back and watch any of the replays of Astronomy yeah. Camp, whether you want to learn about galaxies or talk about nebulosity or just want to start with the moon. We covered all kinds of great stuff uh, during Keith, Astronomy Camp with the moon. Just before we, we go into any Q&A that we've got now, uh, just before the star party, you were telling us that you had this wonderful um, beginning moment for astronomy camp and then a great culmination to it as well with the moon in the middle to just remind everybody yeah. you know what you had well, to kick off astronomy camp with dr john i'm going to give his punchline here we started astronomy camp with a bang and that was the supernova in m101 uh you know every year it seems every year or two we'll have a really really good supernova a lot of times they're very faint they're in an obscure part of the sky this is in one of the most famous objects in the entire night sky, M101, the Pinwheel Galaxy, clear as day. It was fantastic. We looked at that every day. We talked about what a supernova was. Again, if you don't know, you can watch it on the introduction to Astronomy Camp. And at the end, we closed with this beautiful comet, C 2023. There it is, E1, which is now a SLU 1000 object. So you don't have to. Uh, wait for coordinate missions or try and find someone to schedule it for you. It's a SLU 1000 object. Anybody can see this. And uh, what a great way to begin and end space camp. Uh, uh, exactly. Camp. I, I, I think uh, I think it was, I, I'm sure you timed that supernova deliberately just for astronomy camp. To, so it, well, I think you're the one who timed it. You said that's where you, you tell <laughs> students to look. You said this is one of the parts of the sky to look. Well, I did. Lo and behold, I did. There, there was one particular school who uh, wanted to start their own uh, supernova campaign, searching campaign. And the Pinwall Galaxy M101 was one of the galaxies that I said to them, take a look at that one, you know, image them every night. They didn't unfortunately capture it, but oh, they were days away. But anyway, what we are looking at now, we are going to take some questions if anybody's got questions for us. But what we're looking at now is this comet. Now, I did warn you that the images were not going to be the prettiest. Why? Because the sky is lit up with moonlight tonight from this pesky full sturgeon supermoon. It's even brighter moonlight tonight than it normally is. How much brighter is it, John? How much brighter is a supermoon to a, a, a mini moon? Is 30% brighter. 30% brighter. I mean, that's a massive amount. So if we hop back to our comet image again, what we can see here, I don't know if you can see that horrible circle around the image there. We're using an ultra sensitive CCD camera to capture those images that we saw of the moon earlier. What's actually happened is on that CCD chip, this sensor, that moon image, that bright, bright moon image has almost been burnt into the ccd so that's why we're seeing that kind of ghost of the moon that's why we don't normally use the big telescopes to capture the moon but over the next few missions that'll slowly disappear so anyway while we're taking your questions we'll watch this because it will turn into color and the color image of this particular comet won't be quite as dirty and muddy as the image is looking at the moment but we'll certainly uh, stick to that so have we got any questions uh gretchen can come on and tell us if there are any questions or john i don't know if anybody else has uh, kept an eye on q and a and whether or not we've got some questions to answer. Oh, I haven't seen any questions, just lots of great comments. Um, people really enjoying the moon. We're live on Twitter and Facebook as well, and people are really having a lot of great night. Well, in that case, let's go if we haven't got any questions. So you can see what time, you still got time to throw those questions in. But John, I asked you earlier to give us a little bit of a preview. 
Gretchen's going to take us through all of the events that we've got coming up, but we've got a specific lunar event coming up in about 28 days time, haven't we? Tell us about that. We do. We do. So it takes the moon about 29 and a half days to go from full moon to full moon. And, uh, you know, we just learned that the August full moon is named the sturgeon moon. But there, but with the number of days that are in August, we're actually going to have a second full moon in August. So is this is this the sturgeon moon 2.0? Is this uh, is this a, a non prehistoric fish? Is this the, is this the salmon moon? What's going on? Well, no, the, when this happens, this is called a blue moon. So coming in with another another color coming another off color. of uh, Milton's Milton's section, um, but uh, but yeah, so that's so, so it that's... has nothing to do. The moon is not going to look blue. It's just this. Str- oh, look at that! We've got to talk about the comet just when it goes oh. into its color view. So that's a lot less noisy now. So we've had the color data from the CCD cameras added to this, John. Let's take a little bit of a break. Explain what we're seeing here, because I can see a very dense kind of greenish kind of glow, but then I can see a fuzziness around it. That's the comet. But what are we actually kind of looking at now? I, when I think of comets, I think of like a, 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 a kind of a, a, a dirty snowball coming into the solar system, traveling really fast and what what ends up happening is um, high energy radiation from the sun, typically uh, what are called alpha particles, start stripping off layers of the comet and casting this kind of tail um, in the direction away from the sun. And it's not necessarily, you know, the, the, these comet tails aren't like an exhaust from a rocket. They're just, they're, they're in a radial direction away from the sun. And so that's what we're what we're watching. We're yeah. watching a comet, basically a snowball, basically uh, melting as it's coming. But we're in. not we're not actually seeing the snowball, are we? There, the dirty snowball is actually hidden in all of this dust and gas, which is being given off. Because one of the interesting right. one of the interesting things is that you know if we think about this you new know, dirty snowball, if we melt. A snowball it normally turns to water and then if we boiled it up it might turn to steam but it kind of misses out a few phases because those high energy particles are incredibly energetic and it does something yeah. really quite violent actually to that ice doesn't it? it it yeah yeah it does it does it, it's really amazing uh to see the the extent of the the envelope around the yeah. the actual comma and itself. And it's, it's sublimating the, the ice, isn't it? So mm-hmm. it's turning the ice straight into, you know, vapor. Vapor, it's skipping the liquid phase. Yeah, the liquid <laughs> phase. Um, so what we're seeing here actually is way, way bigger than the comet nucleus. The comet, most comets are normally around three to 12 miles. That's the actual solid bit underneath it. But then we get what's called the coma, which is this new, very large kind of envelope of all of this dust and gas, which is being blown off and sublimated off the comet. And then we get the tails coming off. Now, you know, tails come and go. They always say, you know, comets are like cats. They, they've got two tails and do whatever they please. Um, yeah. But sometimes these cometary tails can stretch millions and millions of miles. And when sometimes the great comets that you see, things like Comet Halley or Hale Bop, that you'll see them arching across the sky way bigger than maybe five, six, or even 10 moon diameters across the sky. Now, we haven't had a great comet for a long time, but my goodness, all you've got to do is hop over to uh, some of SLU's guide pages and you'll see some of the absolutely spectacular comets that we've seen over the years, some of them with these great big tails. And we have suddenly, John, you get a bit of the solar wind blasting the tail and actually breaks the tail. And it's been it's absolutely fabulous. You never know what they're going to do night to night, hour to hour. Um, but anyway, as you say, anybody can you know, set up a mission, control the slew telescopes to capture this comet themselves. And you can snap images from any of the live feeds. So uh, uh, 
Any questions yet otherwise? Let's hear what is coming up at SLU. So, Gretchen, any, any questions coming up? Or would you like to tell us what we've got to look forward to over the next, uh, let's say, uh, 12 months or so? Oh, OK. Just... Yeah, I, absolutely. And I am going to just butt in here and share my screen. Um, we have a SLU. <laughs> of great events on the horizon, oh, but a boom, yep. and, and some fantastic webinars for educators and some really marvelous meetups for our members. So um, on Sunday nights, we all meet on Discord and we just have Sunday space chat. And that's just really this talking about what's current and new and far out ideas that have to do with space. Tuesdays at eight, it's another great members party that's on Zoom and we all gather there on Tuesdays. Um, and some great events coming up, Percy yeah, public and ones, Shower, yes. right? That's a public show. And then also of what John was talking about, the blue supermoon, um, which is not Sturgeon Moon 2.0. It is its own very special magical exactly. event that's exactly. coming up. And then, of course, Ring of Fire annual, annular eclipse, say that two times fast. And that leads to next year's 2024 Great American yeah. Eclipse. Um, but I also wanted to talk about these really great educator workshop that um, John, Dr. John will be doing. Um, the mystery of the island universe is using saloon education is going to be one of them. And then you, Mr. Paul Cox, you are going to be introducing the next gen of SLU in a couple of yes. weeks. Yes, this is after our next release. So we're on release candidate one at the moment. The website has behaved perfectly this evening for us. The telescopes have behaved perfectly this evening. Uh, but actually, the Perseid Meteor Shower is one of the ones I'm looking forward to. So that's another public um, public star party. So it'll be on Twitter, it'll be on YouTube, it'll be on our Facebook as well. Um, that's a nice leisurely affair probably over well as long as people can hang around really uh but we've had some great meteor showers and this one is pretty good this year because i don't know if you've noticed it but we're kind of in the beginning of the month and we're at full moon so you can see the percy meteor shower is about mid-month in a couple of weeks time which means that it's virtually new moon so there's no moonlight to spoil the view because you want a really dark sky to see the percy meteor shower it's not the most prolific meteor shower in the year, but it's one of the best because us in the Northern Hemisphere, which is where it's best seen from, it's normally reasonably warm and normally quite clear for a lot of people. So we're looking forward to that one. Um, but John, tell us a little bit about um, what educators can look forward to in Mystery of the Island Universes, uh, the webinar that you're doing. Yeah, so th this is a webinar for any and all educators uh, from elementary school through college. Uh, we're going to go through uh, the quest learning activities that, that I mentioned or we talked about earlier in tonight's program. Uh, we're going to learn how to find them, um, what standards they're aligned to, how your students are going to be using them in the classroom. Uh, but because Next Gen SLUs is going to be um, fully, on, fully engaged, uh, we're, we're going to be able to take a look at some of the new quest features as well. Um, particularly, we're going to look at the mystery of the island universe's quest and how that quest, um, how your students can use that quest to learn and classify different galaxies, because that quest is uh, is a seasonal quest and it is going to be at the perfect time to start on August 24th. So come on to this, uh, this star party, learn about yeah. this quest, and then you can assign it to your students the next day. It's going to be a good one. And uh, John, you know, we've got seasonal quests running throughout the year and you're going to help educators actually plan out their year because some educators are only teaching astronomy sometimes just for a two week course or maybe a semester or something like that. But what a lot of educators that have already been using SLU are doing is they're keeping their students engaged with some of your seasonal quests so that they do those after their course is finished. Um, which is great. And I know Keith has been doing the same because Keith has been keeping a whole cohort of students engaged in learning about astronomy over the summer holidays. So thank you once again, Keith, for doing that. But uh, unless anybody has got anything else, we will wind up for now. Uh, don't forget, if you're watching on Twitter or Facebook or YouTube, 
and come and join SLU. You don't have to be a student. We also have a family membership as well. Um, so you can get all of your kids and family involved in SLU. If you enjoy doing this kind of stuff, we do it every single night. We watch these live telescope views. And don't forget, we've got more telescopes joining the network. We've got our Australia Observatory, New Australian Observatory, which is at the Siding Spring Observatory, about 200 yards away from that. Um, in Australia, it's one of the world's best observatory sites. Uh, we've got a new half meter telescope being installed there. Um, hopefully that's going to happen beginning right at the very beginning of September, just in time for the new school year. And then We've got a new half meter telescope joining the existing half meter telescope in the Canary Islands. That's our flagship observatory, the Institute of Astrophysics of the Canary Islands. And that, I don't know if you all agree, has been my favorite view that we've had of the moon tonight. The close up shots from Chile and Canary 4 are kind of good, but I don't know that that image that the uh, Canary One half meter telescope you know, when we use that for special events like this, it just knocks my socks off every single time. Maybe we should do specifically for anybody who's captured an image of this supermoon using the Canary One half meter telescope tonight. Let's do, even if it's just a special member only show for students and other members of the next micro or mini full moon. So you can capture a picture of that and you can then make your own graphic like john showed us earlier here's a super moon here's a mini moon and anybody who ever says to you after that a super moon isn't super you can show them the evidence so anyway thank you everybody uh, for joining me tonight thank you john thank you milton thank you keith it's always lovely having your perspectives thank you very much gretchen for um uh, making sure that everything goes smoothly and keeping an eye on all of our guests tonight. So thank you, everybody. We will see you uh, in the member star parties, but we'll see everybody uh, for the Perseid Meteor Show on Saturday, August 12th, 8 p.m. EDT. Until then, thank you very much for joining us. Bye, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you. <laughs>